Hello, my name is Ed Chapman, and this slideshow is going to cover microscopes, how they changed biology, and how do they work as machines. A little bit first about the history of microscopes. Microscopes started out as telescopes, and the people that built the first microscopes knew how to make and change and manufacture lenses, like lenses you'd find in eyeglasses today. The first microscopes were put together starting in about the middle of the 1600s, about 1650, and two scientists get credit for inventing the first good microscopes that could be used for biology. One of the first scientists was Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Uh, here's a picture of him, a uh, classic 17th century thinker with the wig and everything. His microscope was a very small device. You could hold it in one hand, and you placed a small little sample on a basically a little pointy nail, and you held the whole thing up to the light. Uh, he was from the Netherlands, so we would say that he's Dutch, and he used his microscope to observe things like pond water and sour milk and blood, semen, and lots of other things that people were curious about. Uh, he discovered sperm cells, and he noticed that they were swimming, and he noticed also that they were very similar to creatures he saw in pond water, which he nicknamed animalcules. Here are some pictures of from Anton von Leeuwenhoek's notebooks. He drew very well and very carefully the objects that he saw. A lot of these objects are small animals that are multicellular and you'll notice in the upper left hand corner some pictures of sperm cells that he observed. Uh, very good artist. Uh, of course they didn't have photography back then. He kept very good notes and so we know exactly what he looked at. The other scientist was Robert Hooke and he was from England and he used his microscope to observe very thin slices of plant material and he discovered that plant material is made up of all these little tiny rooms and he nicknamed them cells after the small rooms that monks live in and Anton von Leeuwenhoek's, excuse me, Robert Hooke's microscope was a much larger affair and it looked a lot more like a telescope and he's credited with using the word cell to describe the smallest unit of life. He was the first person to do that, so that kind of makes him important. The first microscopes, uh, this is a picture here of Anton, excuse me, of Robert Hooke's microscope with the, um, with the lenses to focus light. The first microscopes used light to illuminate a thin sample or a specimen and that means that the specimen had to be very small and transparent, had to be sliced pretty thin if it was a piece of something, and it had to be placed in a holder or on a slide. And the microscopes were built so there was only one magnification. There was no such thing as low power or high power. The problem with these microscopes is they generated a lot of heat because of obviously these lenses focusing bright light on a little point. You tend to cook your sample, so that was a problem with the first early microscopes. Modern light microscopes use cooler lights that are also brighter, and obviously they're powered by electricity today. Uh, mostly fluorescent type tubes, like in the microscopes we're going to be using in the class. And they also have multiple magnifications, which makes them compound microscopes. You can pick whether you're using low power or high power. Problems with micro light microscopes overall are that the specimens you're looking at have to be cut very thin in order for light to pass through them. And when you shine light on something, the light usually heats it up, and heat can fade and dry out specimens. And light microscopes can only magnify about 400 times. After that, it just gets too hard to focus. Uh, the problem of drying is also called dehydration, and you'll see that in lab when we make some wet mount slides. Other microscopes that are used by scientists today include electron microscopes. And the first kind of electron microscope we're going to talk about is the scanning electron microscope, or SEM. This thing looks like a big cabinet with a computer attached to it. And it can magnify objects in three dimensions. It can give you a 3D picture, things like insect heads or fly heads. It produces very sharp, clear images on a computer screen. But you can't see inside of specimens using it. Uh, here's a picture of an ant using a scanning electron microscope, a close-up of the ant's eye, and a close-up of a moth head. And you can see how they're both insects and they both have compound eyes. Really cool pictures made with scanning electron microscopes. The other kind of electron microscope is a transmission electron microscope. And this machine looks like something out of Star Wars. It big, it sits on top of a cabinet, had all sorts of knobs and wheels, and transmission electron microscopes, or TEMs, can magnify specimens 
over a quarter of a million times larger than they really are. And these are the microscopes that are used to reveal cell parts and organelles like mitochondria and chloroplasts and ribosomes. Here are some pictures taken with a transmission electron microscope. And you notice that these are slices of things because you're seeing inside of things. So they have a lot of the same problems that you have with light microscopes, except that they can magnify much, 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 much more because they use a beam of electrons to um, basically light up the sample or the specimen. Compound light microscope parts that you need to know, we're going to list and identify on a, a standard compound light microscope like the ones we use in the classroom. Here are the parts, and we're going to go over each part on a diagram. Here's your compound light microscope, and the first part that you need to know about is the eyepiece. The eyepiece is where you put your face, and the eyepieces on the microscopes we're using in the lab today are magnifying 10 times, or 10x. The next part of the microscope you need to be familiar with is the object or are the objective lenses, which on our microscopes there are four of them to choose from and they're different powers. Ours go from 10x all the way up to 40x. The next part of the microscope you need to know is going to be the nose piece and this is the part that rotates so that you can pick which objective lens you want to place into the path of the light coming up from the light source. After the nose piece, you need to know something about the slide, the slide, excuse me, the, the stage, which has stage clips and it's a flat surface right below the objective lenses where you're going to mount your slides and put them under the stage clips so that it doesn't move when you move the microscope. The next part that you need to know is going to be the diaphragm. Um, this is probably the secret weapon of light microscopes. It's how you adjust the amount of light coming up through the stage. A lot of students forget about the diaphragm and they'll raise their hand and say they can't see anything because their sample's either so dark, there's not enough light, or there's so much light everything's washed out. So you, you adjust your diaphragm to control the amount of light coming up through the stage. Our next compound light microscope part is the light source, which in our class is, are going to be either fluorescent light bulbs or very small little flashlight type light bulbs. They all get warm over time, so you have to be careful after the microscope's been running for a few minutes when you pick it up because the base of the microscope is going to be warm. And finally, we have the knobs that we use to focus, the coarse focus, which is the large knob, and the fine focus, which is the small knob. You use the coarse focus on low power only because it moves the stage up and down fast. And you've got to be careful focusing because you don't want to push your objective lens through your slide and break the glass. And finally, I think the last part is the base, which is heavy and makes the microscope stable so that it'll sit flat on your desk and won't move around while you're trying to look through it. Also contains all the electronics for the light source. All right. How to calculate magnification. Magnification for a microscope is simply the amount of magnification you get from the eyepiece multiplied by the amount of magnification you get from the objective lens you've chosen. So for example, if you chose the 10x low power objective and, excuse me, you're, you're using the 10x eyepiece and you chose the um, 10x objective lens, 10 times 10 is 100, so your total magnification would be 100 times. But if you rotated the medium or the 25x objective lens into place, multiplying that by the same eyepiece, because you don't change the eyepiece, it's going to be 250 times magnification. And finally, the maximum we can magnify on our microscopes here at school is 400x, which uses the high power or the 40x objective lens. Okay, focusing problems. The higher the magnification you choose, the harder it is to get the image in focus. So we're always going to start focusing on low power. Um, use the coarse adjustment knob or the, the bigger focusing knob to do this, to get it in focus under low power. Then you're going to rotate the nose piece to the higher objective lenses and it should still be close to being in focus when you look through the eyepiece. If it's not, you're going to use only the fine focus adjustment to bring your image into a nice sharp clear view. If you try to use the coarse focus under any of the other magnifications, it's going to be very difficult. Practice makes purpose. Perf practice makes perfect. All right, some problems with light. 
Um, the higher the magnification, the more light you're going to need. So how do you increase the amount of light? Well, you're going to open up the diaphragm. If you look under the stage, if you tilt your microscope carefully, you'll notice that the diaphragm is a wheel with holes in it. The larger the hole, the more light it's going to let through up to the stage. So in, in order to increase the light, you just rotate the diaphragm to a larger hole. And you adjust the diaphragm while you're looking through the eyepiece. You'll see there's a little wheel you can turn with your finger. Uh, like I said, the diaphragm is like the secret weapon of the light microscope. So learn how to use it. All right, when you're observing living organisms like things in pond water, they're probably going to be trying to swim away from the light. So they're going to be hard to observe. Uh, some ways around this is to try to get them trapped in some debris or some junk on the slide so they can't swim away. And over time, they're all going to eventually die because the light and the bright light, excuse me, the bright light is heating up the, the field of view and you're basically cooking them. So they're not going to last very long. But there's probably always more to look at. All right. That does it. Thank you very much for paying attention, and I hope you enjoy using the microscope.